wow, there are a lot of you out there. <laughs> I was kind of hoping we were on a trend last week, not quite as many people. Thought we might be moving in that direction, but apparently not. Um, first, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just thanks for your presence. Thanks for your spirit, and uh, just thanks for this church. Father, you've graced us in so many ways. We just pray you'd be with us this morning and uh, continue to direct our steps. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, thanks first for all of you that have helped uh, with prayers, encouragement, financially. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I've made uh, five trips to Turkey and Greece. So you're going to get a little added, added benefit this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about Greece as well. Um, but thanks. Thanks for all the help. And, um, you know, when I was asked to uh, talk by Chris here a few weeks ago, I started thinking, there's so much information. Six months over the last two years in Greece and Turkey um, that I've dedicated my life to, and it's hard to tell that in 20 or 25 minutes. So I've had to take a step back and look at this from a little larger perspective. Uh, I thought about sharing just facts. You know, that's, that's always good. Talk about the refugee crisis and put, put you to sleep with data, and that would be good for me. But that doesn't really tell the story. And I do have to share a little bit of data with you just to kind of keep you in the um, flow of how this thing worked in continuity for me. So it breaks down into several parts. One is the, uh, the Syrian conflict. Uh, next is how and why I got involved. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Greece, my trips there, and then uh, Turkey where I'm working currently. So uh, the, the Syrian civil war began at the tail end of the Arab Spring back in 2011. At that time, the population in Syria was 21 million people. In 2016, the population dropped down to about 13 million. So all those other people displaced. Most of them internally, but about 5 million outside of the country. So the Mediterranean crossing, which is the route most people take to get away from Turkey and Syria and Iraq, it's a dangerous route. In 2015, 3,800 people drowned trying to make that trip. In 2016, 5,000 people drowned making that trip. And then in 2017, an additional 3,100 people drowned trying to make that trip. So in three years, almost 12,000 people drowned trying to get away from war and the horrors of war. Many people are still in Syria, just not in their homes. You know, they're displaced persons. But they've all started, the ones that have moved have started moving to neighboring countries, which kind of makes sense. If you look at the uh, route to Europe, people are leaving Iraq or Syria and going through Turkey, across the Mediterranean generally, to Greece, to the islands, then from Greece up into Macedonia or the Balkans, and then north into what's considered safe Europe. Okay, so that provides the framework. But I'll, just a note, I'm going to say NGOs several times through this uh, discussion this morning. And an NGO is a non-governmental agency. They're usually not directed by the government, so they, they uh, kind of have their own say in what they do. And, uh, and I've worked with a few of them. But it's a, ch it's a charitable group who's not under the control of a government. So think Mercy Corps, Samaritan's Purse, Salvation Army. Those are all kind of examples of NGOs. Okay, so as a Christian, I believe when I'm aware of a need, I have a responsibility to respond in a Jesus-like manner to the best of my ability. You know, I've learned this lesson many times over the past 61 years, but no lesson was greater than the one learned here at this church back in 2011. A lot of you were part of that. This church responded selflessly and tirelessly to immediate and long-term needs in our area for months. 
not exclusively to people who attend church here, not to people who met a certain demographic, just people who had needs, and we met them. My first trip to Greece was prompted by a series of events, um, pictures of scripture, pieces of scripture speaking about aliens, widows, orphans, the hurting and the lost, a failed, on my part, opportunity to travel to Jordan in 2013 to work with a church that was serving refugees there, about 10 kilometers south of the Syrian border. At that time, there were 150,000 Syrian refugees living in El Zatari camp near Mafrat, Jordan. I didn't go, but I began following the events in the Mideast a little closer to kind of keep up, to stay in the loop, watching social media feeds, news articles, following various charity groups who were involved with refugees. Alice and I began sending money to volunteers and NGOs who were helping Syrian refugees. One of them, a personal hero of mine, Rachel Emick, a mom with several kids and a husband from the UK, was one of my earliest contacts. Rachel was an independent volunteer, which meant she worked at her own discretion and did what she wanted to do or what she thought needed to be done in her own direction. I followed her work in southern Turkey as she helped women and children providing food, medicine, clothing, and sometimes just a sympathetic ear as the need arose. When she returned home, she held bake sales, yard sales, did specific fundraising for needs, and then returned to Turkey again and again. And she's still doing that. Like four years later, she's still going. So in September of 2015, Alice and I cried at the picture of a three-year-old Syrian boy washed up on the western shore of Turkey. And I thought, surely now somebody's going to do something about this nut, nutty situation. But it didn't stop. So I began paying a little bit closer attention to gentle nudges, a verse of scripture, daily devotional, newspaper articles, Bible studies, Sunday school lessons, all that were seemingly heaven sent. And at some point in time I knew I had to get involved beyond sending money. God can make his call irresistible to the point where everything else pales in comparison and seems unimportant. This time I listened. I read a lot the Bible, Bible studies, and a variety of books. And through this time period, I was reading Radical by David Platt, The Insanity of God and the Insanity of Obedience by Nick Ripkin. Great books. Books which spoke about serving others in tough places like Somalia, China, North Korea, the former Eastern Bloc. They opened my eyes to Christians sacrificially serving in dangerous areas of the world. So right now I want to share couple of scriptures, pieces of scripture that spoke to me over and over again for several months through 2014 and 2015. I really hope this is keeping up with me or it's never going to make any sense. But anyways, so from Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And then in the interest of time, I'm going to use the salient lines from Matthew 25. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And then from Matthew 25, 45, he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. In Luke 10, Jesus gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. In my mind, he left no doubt as to expectations for helping the least of these. When the law expert was asked by Jesus in verse 37, which of these three men was a neighbor to the man who was hurt? He replied, the man who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. So I went. Greece was an eye-opening experience. 15,000 people living in 170 170 acres worth of farmer fields at the Greek-Macedonian border. It was a mess. It was near the town of Edomini with a population of 300 people. And the, the residents were greatly outnumbered. But for the most part, they were gracious and helpful. 
Borders closing, rain, mud, children in flip-flops or shoes too large for little feet or no shoes at all, and tension from the various ethnic groups and tight confines and limited resources for way too many people. There was little food, little water, no sanitation, not much space, no medicine, and not much clothing. So as an independent volunteer, I teamed with a variety of people, faces changing daily, coming from all over primarily Europe. We provided what we could through the camps at Edomini and Echo starting the day I arrived in Greece. So there was medical care, food, clothing, countless pairs of shoes provided both at Edomini and Echo camps. Echo held 2,500 people, and Edomini, as I said, held about 15,000. And just a quick note, yeah, Echo Camp, if, I don't know if you can see this, was a gas station. I mean, they called it a camp, but it was really just a gas station along the freeway. In every place, place there was grass, there was a tent. And you can see, I mean, there were 2,500 people camped out at, well, maybe not, you couldn't pull that off at ELs, but, you know, a much larger, like a, you know, like a freeway gas station, but 2,500 people, you know, sitting in tents in March of 2016 at a gas station. As it worked out, I stayed at a guest house in northern Greece whose owners had been helping refugees passing through their town for two years. So for my second shift job, we formed another group of independent volunteers within a few days of my ar arrival. So it consisted of a Swedish businesswoman, an Englishman, several Greeks, a Dutchman, and a couple of Americans, including myself. Our thought that we came up with was to help vulnerable, vulnerable persons within these camps, get them out of the camps, out of the mud, and into apartments. Didn't know how many we were gonna help, just kind of figured it was a good idea to try and help who you could. This program lasted for a little over a year, providing rent, utilities, food, transportation, and medical care to our families. Ultimately, 14 families were helped by getting them out of the dirt camps and placing them in apartments. The first family we took out, uh, the wife had a baby three weeks after moving into, uh, into the apartment. Whew. We also provided school supplies, shots, and backpacks for other refugee children who moved to towns and villages in our areas. The Greek government moved most of the 55,000 refugees from camps in the rough to military-run camps in May of 2016. Some were in abandoned factories with tents provided for individual families. Others were former military bases, but overall the conditions improved. Later in some areas, local municipalities began putting families into apartments. And some months behind that, the federal government got on board and did the same thing. My third trip to Northern Greece in November 2016, I worked with a an honest to gosh NGO based out of Norway, Drop and I Have It, which is Drop in the Ocean, is working at a former military airstrip in Nikavala, 12 miles south of the Macedonian border. The first week I was there, we opened what was called the Drop Shop, a little marketplace that was inside the camp itself, providing clothing and necessities for uh, the residents. The government-run camps installed ISO containers to replace the UNHCR tents. Greek winters are pretty tough. In that area, you're south of the Macedonian mountains, and, and there's snow on the peaks just about year-round. It is cold, bitter cold. And actually, Nikavala, the locals call it center of the winds. So all the wind from up north comes down and centers on this place where they decide to put a refugee camp. What a great idea. So I spent two months in Nikavala with Drop in the Ocean supporting about 1,700 people in two different camps. For the first several weeks I was there, we supported a Cherso camp, which was primarily Kurdish. That was about 10 miles south of the border and a little bit east of where we were. Had a population of about 300 people and they were all living in tents. All the Kurds were eventually combined and moved into two camps 
further south in Greece. Drop in the Ocean had a store, two warehouses, and a camp staging area. Two brilliant Dutch guys created an app which helped manage and track inventory of all the, uh, all the material they'd received in donations. There were almost daily donations. I mean, sometimes it was just a box or a couple boxes, and sometimes it was literally a truckload of boxes on pallets. So we had to sort, categorize by type, size, and gender so we could get them out to, uh, to residents in a timely fashion. And the residents were offered a scheduled clothes shopping experience with personal assistance. This was pretty cool, actually. 45 minutes every 10 days, they got to come in and go shopping for needs. And so um, it worked out that uh, certain items went faster than others. So if you don't have washing machines and dryers, underwear and things like that tend to go pretty fast. So underwear was a big seller. Um, additionally, Drop, Drop in the Ocean provided uh, weekly fresh fruit and vegetable distribution to the residents of both camps. Repeatedly thanked by volunteers, I'm sorry, by uh, the residents, just for the way that we responded and treated people like human beings, which is kind of mostly what people are looking for, you know? Treat me like a human, you know? I'm no different than you. And, and so that was, it was pretty easy to do. There were people with families, and before they came to Greece, there were people who had jobs and homes and cars and, you know, lived in cities, very, fairly metropolitan. Syria was really kind of a, like Jordan, a very calm, stable country in the Mideast, relatively speaking. But again, the, ch the church, this church, came through. When there was a need, primarily shoes and sweats, we pitched in and purchased quality items to be distributed to the camp residents. We spent in excess of $3,000 over that two-month period for the Syrians in this camp. Strange thing, an aside. So sweatpants, you think, sweatpants, hmm. But sweatpants work two ways. Again, this is November, December, January in Greece, kind of cold, snow on the ground, wind blowing hard. So sweats work as long johns. You know, you put them under and then put some pants over them so they keep you warm. And on the nice days, which weren't many, but when, on the nice days, they were just outer clothing. So sweatpants were big sellers. After returning home in January 2017, I continued to stay involved with refugees and volunteers in Greece. During my time online, I came across a group called REFI, Refugee Volunteers International. They were an NGO working in Izmir, Turkey, helping primarily widows and their families. REFI is a group of Syrian, Turkish, and international volunteers helping families through job opportunities, education, and emergency aid in Izmir. I've traveled to Izmir twice in 2017 2018 to work with refugees. Izmir is a primary hub of smugglers who are taking advantage of refugees going to Europe via the Greek islands. Turkey is the home to, to an estimated 3.4 million Syrian refugees. Looking at the map, it kind of makes sense, right? So if you're from Syria and you're low on funds, you're going to go to the next closest safe place. So that looks like in the north, Turkey, in the east, Iran, Iraq, in the south, Jordan, and in the west, Lebanon. So a lot of people ran out of money and stopped where they ran out of money. Others wanted to be close to home or stay in a, you know, a culturally similar area. People that speak our language and you know, act like we act, eat what we eat. But I have to say, over the two years I've been doing this, most of the Syrians I've met, when asked, want to go home when it's safe to do so. There are 135,000 Syrian refugees in the province of Izmir. Many are living in camps in the rough or working as laborers for one of the agricultural concerns or farmers. The daily wage, hear me, the daily wage 
runs from $2.50 to $6. Workers stay in tents or sheds, tend to a unit at the farms and pay $200 to $300 a month in rent. There's limited access to grocery stores, no medical care, and not all camps have access to clean water, and most have poor sanitary conditions. It's a miserable existence with the entire family pitching in to pay for rent and food. Many of you have seen the knitted products and the bracelets and other craft items I brought back from Turkey made by Syrian women. Most of these women are widowed, losing husbands to the conflict in Syria. Revy is currently working to open markets to allow, to allow these products to be moved into markets in Europe, South America, and the USA. As we open these markets, it'll, it allows us the opportunity to bring more people, more women in, to help make additional crafts. And really, it's all about self-sustaining. You know, we want to try and get these people to the point where they're making enough money that they can, they can pay their rent, they can buy food, and, and take care of themselves. So half of the money raised goes to the crafters, and the other half goes to supporting Revy projects. Revy provides two schools, one in Basmani, which is down at the bottom of the mountain, and the other one's in Kadifakali, which is up near the castle at the top of the mountain in Izmir. This is areas where the refugee population is relatively high. Their children are taught a little bit of Turkish because, you know, go figure, to go to a Turkish school, you have to be able to speak Turkish. They're also taught Arabic, so they keep in tune with their culture. Math, crafts, and they get a little bit of exercise class in there as well. Revy employs six teachers and three coordinators. They are the only paid staff, and they're all Syrian refugees. We support 40 families, 30 bracelet families who make bracelets, and 10 uh, knitting families who make knitted items about 140 people, and as much as it bothers me to say it, we can't help everyone, but we can help them. All my trips have allowed me to share the reason I'm involved with refugees, my faith. Many times I've been able to share my faith with other volunteers who previously had a negative view of religion in general and Christianity specifically. In most cases, I was able to leave leave them with a little different perspective, a positive perspective of religion, Christianity, and Jesus and who he is. You know, in Turkey, I stayed, both times I was there, I stayed in a hostel that had a constant churn. You know, there were people coming and going all the time from all over, mostly Europe, but sometimes India and the Mideast and Far East. And it provided me with another place where I could share my faith, strangely enough. You know, the place when I went home and rested at night was uh, also fertile ground. So, um, so I had a chance to share what work I was doing, my faith, with Hindus, Sufis, Muslims, Sums, nuns, and everything in between. Very non-confrontational, very much a civil discussion. And I find that most people welcome open dialogue in a non-judgmental environment. It just kind of works better that way. The camps and trips varied greatly. Initially, Greece was the wild west of refugees. There were 15,000 refugees, primarily Syrian, jammed against the Greek border with Macedonia. That changed to government-run camps, and now many refugees have been moved to semi-permanent housing. Turkey, on the other hand, has a mixture of living conditions, apartments, if you can afford them, government camps, and camps in the rough. There are volunteers in both countries providing limited aid where allowed and whenever possible. I'm going to leave you with the last verse that returns to me often and a couple closing comments. So from Romans 10, keeping up with me, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? So wrapping up, refugees aren't terrorists. Syrians would have never thought 
they would be refugees in 2010 or before. Pray for refugees, for the workers, for opportunity to share and be Jesus' hands and feet, for Christians to step into the lives of people who are desperate, helpless, and largely hopeless. Become aware, learn more. There's mainstream media, which gives us one story, and there's the other side, non-conventional news sources, Al Jazeera, BBC, some Facebook and social media feeds give you a little clearer picture of what's really going on, especially if you're chasing down what's happening with refugees. And if so inclined, send money. The UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, Frontiers, Refugees International, the IRC, World Relief, Doctors Without Borders, Mercy Corps, Rebbe. None of these people can do their work without some money. So, wrapping up, go, be sent, we're commanded. Thank you.